Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for being here for another Mystery Monday. Yay! Today's case was very well requested by all you guys, so I was really excited to get more into it than I had previously. I knew about the case, I knew what happened. I think most of the world knows about John Benet Ramsey. I was excited to kind of get deeper in and see if my original opinion on what happened just from seeing like news coverage and things like that changed when I actually got into the nitty gritty details of everything. And I can tell you that it kind of did a little bit. Before we get started, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I have started a Patreon. It has come to my attention that YouTube doesn't really like to monetize this kind of content, and I always knew that it wasn't very ad-friendly, but apparently YouTube and advertisers don't really um, gravitate towards this type of content, especially in the way I tell it in an opinionated manner, because the advertisers don't wanna be responsible for my personal opinion, and that makes complete sense, and I get it. But since coming to this realization, I've also realized that because of the time and effort I put into these videos, it's gonna be a little bit harder to do so while also focusing on work, and obviously I have kids and everything, so I have to split myself pretty evenly. Now obviously, you can head over to my Patreon and support me if you'd like, that would always be appreciated. Your continued support watching these videos is of course always appreciated. Whatever you can do is always appreciated and I would never ask anybody ever to donate money to a cause that they didn't believe in or weren't able to. Whatever you can do, that Patreon link will be in my description. If you'd like to use it, you can. There are several different tiers and the rewards range from having access to Patreon only content to having access to my Patreon lens, having access to a Facebook page where we can all chat about these cases and all these tiers kind of give you a little bit more insight into my process creatively and how I research my videos and things like that and also a little bit more access to me personally. So if you would like to do that, the links in the description box. If you would not, then let's just carry on as we always were and that's absolutely fine. Thank you guys so much. As always, I appreciate you being here. Let's get right into the case. So the story of John Bonet Ramsey is a really big case. I think everybody had their own opinion about what happened to her, even though it's one of the biggest unsolved cases to this day in the past 20 something years. Everybody still has their opinion on what happened to her and who did this to her and what kind of story led up to this happening to her. To me, this whole case, and not necessarily what I believe or the relationships or whatever, but it's so reminiscent to the Madeline McCann case because the parents were really tried and found guilty in the court of public opinion. And that can sometimes be the only court that matters. If you guys are interested in checking out what sources I used to research this video, I have left an extensive list of sources in the description box, um, as well as a couple different documentaries that I watched and a book that I read as well. And if you're interested in watching the documentaries that I watched, I think one of them was on Amazon Prime and the book I bought was from Kindle, I will also leave the links to that documentary and the book in my video. And if you could use those links if you wanna purchase it, that would be great. John Monet Ramsey was a six year old beauty queen who lived in Boulder, Colorado with her father, John Bennett Ramsey, her mother, Patsy Ramsey, and her nine year old brother, Burke Ramsey. Let's start with a little bit of background on the family because I really like to set the scene for these kinds of things. I think the history leading up to the crime, I think the family dynamic is important. So let's start with a little background on these people, mostly John and Patsy because Burke was nine, so he really didn't have too much of a background at this point. When John and Patsy were married, she was actually 19 years younger than him, and his marriage to Patsy was his second marriage. From his first marriage, he had three previous children. When John met Patsy, though, she was in her prime, and he fell for her straight away. She was a former Miss West Virginia and graduated from the University of West Virginia with a degree in journalism. Beauty, brains, charisma, all of that wrapped up in this tiny little brunette with this dazzling smile. Of course, John Ramsey fell for her pretty hard. 
But John Ramsey was no slouch himself. He was a Michigan State graduate. He served in the US Navy for 11 years before starting his own business in 1989. Advanced Product Group, which eventually merged with two other companies to form Access Graphics, a computer service company. He became the CEO and president of Access Graphic, and he was named Entrepreneur of the Year by the Boulder Chamber of Commerce in 1996 when the company grossed $1 billion. He and Patsy got married in 1980. They had Burke in 1987, and then in 1990, John Bonet was born. John Bonet's full name was John Bonet Patricia Ramsey. So her first name, John Bonet, is actually named for her father, whose first name is John and middle name Bennett. So John Bonet is basically just a take on John Bennett. And her middle name, Patricia, is obviously her mother's first name. So honestly, I don't think I've ever heard this said often, but the fact that they named her a combination of both their names always struck me as odd especially since they already had a nine-year-old son who they did not choose to name after his father, which would have been a more common occurrence. Firstborn son, named after the father, and then her middle name is her mother's first name. So it always struck me as a little bit narcissistic that these two people basically created a child and then gave her their names combined. I don't know. To me, it just felt a little, a little strange. So together, John and Patsy created a life that anybody looking in from the outside would envy. John did very well in business and became quite a wealthy man. Burke and John Bonet were attractive, well-dressed, well-behaved children. Patsy was the ultimate host. She was the definition of a socialite. She threw lavish parties in her home, always wanted to kind of have the best of everything in her home and on her own person and her children. She always dressed beautifully. Her hair was always done. Her nails were always done. Perfect makeup. She was a former beauty queen, so she really did place a lot of emphasis on physical appearance and she always looked immaculate. Her house always looked immaculate when they had people over for parties. She and John were great hosts. People loved going to their parties. They always felt welcome. They had this gorgeous home in Boulder. They were well known in society. They had a lot of friends. They were just kind of exactly what you would think of when you think of the all-American family and the American dream. You know, I always thought it was a little funny even in 1996 when video wasn't you know a huge thing at that point Patsy would send out her Christmas cards but she also created a Christmas video in which she introduced her beautiful children and her beautiful home and you know she just had to kind of show off that one extra little step a Christmas card wouldn't suffice for Patsy Ramsey and John Bonet was a beautiful girl, and Patsy Ramsey capitalized on her natural beauty and her natural charm and put her on the pageant circuit, just like mommy. She won her first pageant when she was just four and would win four more titles within the next two years. These five pageants were not the only ones she participated in, though, which, if you think about it, between the ages four and six, she won five beauty pageants, but competed in many more, and that feels like a lot of work for a young child under the age of six. It feels like you would constantly have to be traveling around and going to pageants or practicing and rehearsing for these pageants. It just felt like it wouldn't have been much fun for a little girl who just wanted to be a kid and run and play outside. All the people who knew her said she was a beauty queen on the stage, but when she was home, she was a tomboy with skinned knees, picking blueberries from outside, loving to ride her bike. The family's gardener said she used to crack him up because in the fall he would break all the leaves into piles and she would always want to jump into them as soon as he made the piles but he couldn't really even say no to her because she was just so cute and charming and sweet and personable. John Ramsey didn't really agree with John Bonet being in pageants at such a young age but he was really busy with work. He worked a lot. He wasn't home often so he kind of just I guess, let Patsy do her own thing as far as it came to like home life. She was in charge of what happened at home and he was kind of responsible for bringing in the money and they had their specialized kind of jobs and responsibilities in the family and he kind of thought that John Bonet's pageant career fell under the home aspect. 
He has since been quoted as saying, it's not a good idea to put your children on public display. Personally, for me, I don't get the pageant thing. I don't get the pageant thing for adults and I definitely don't get the pageant thing for kids. And if you're into pageants, please don't be offended. I'm from New York. I think this is a Southern kind of thing, like beauty pageants. And I know that in a lot of places in the South, it's deeply ingrained in the culture and kind of passed down from mother to daughter and so on. It's almost kind of assumed sometimes that these girls are just gonna go into pageants. And I do know as these girls grow up that it can open a lot of doors for them socially and in their careers and things. So I guess I understand why people do it, but I, I don't, I don't understand. I know it's a culture thing. I know it's ingrained in people. I know that they're brought up like that. This structure of this video is gonna go a little bit differently because there's so much to talk about. I might have to split it up into two parts. I don't know yet since I haven't really recorded it yet, so I don't know how long it's gonna be, but if it's super, super long, I'll split it into two parts, not four, two, and then I will just post them at the same time so that it's easier for you guys to watch and you can kind of watch in chunks if you want. It's also easier for YouTube to process the video because the longer the video, the longer the processing time and I want this Mystery Monday to be up on time for you guys. So the video is gonna go a little different as far as structure. First, I'll tell you what the Ramses said happened the morning of December 26th when John Benet Ramsey was found dead in her home. And then we're gonna kind of go a little bit deeper and see what the police felt about it, what the FBI felt about it, what other journalists have felt about it since, and what I feel about it myself. There's so many layers here. Like we really have to dig in today, guys. And I think that's what makes John Bonet's story so frustrating and so um, kind of hard to let go of for people because you will literally go through the evidence. You'll go through everybody's story. You'll kind of hear everything and you'll think a certain way. And then as you go through more, you'll think a different way. And at the end, you're left more confused than you were before you knew nothing. So I really want to give you guys all the information that I was able to find. And then in the comments, let me know what you think, but try to be kind. All right, so according to Patsy and John Ramsey, the morning after Christmas day in 1996, Patsy awoke early and went downstairs to put on some coffee. The reason that Patsy woke up early that morning was because it was the day after Christmas and they were actually leaving to go on vacation, the family. So they had to get up early and she got up early to get everybody you know, ready and make sure everything was packed. The typical mom thing to do. I know when we go on vacation, I'm the first one up because I'm paranoid. I wanna make sure I have all like my hair products and all my makeup and I don't wanna be rushed, especially when you have a plane to catch. Not that it would really matter though because the Ramses were very wealthy, as I said, and they owned two private planes and a yacht. And John was actually a pilot. He flew the planes himself. Patsy Ramsey goes downstairs to make coffee, like I said, and on the spiral staircase, going downstairs from the third floor of her home where the master bedroom is located, she saw a note, a ransom letter, essentially, three pages laid out on the spiral staircase. The ransom letter was addressed to Mr. Ramsey. Upon closer inspection, she discovered it was a ransom note from a small foreign faction who had taken her daughter. The note said that John Bonet was safe and unharmed, which seems like the same thing to me, but she would not remain that way unless John Ramsey paid a ransom of $118,000. The letter gave very specific instructions, including that they shouldn't talk to anybody, they shouldn't call the police, they shouldn't alert authorities in any way, gave specific instructions as to what denomination the bills should be in, and the letter also gave instructions on when they should be expecting to receive a call from the kidnappers that morning to set up the ransom exchange. If they did not follow these instructions to a T, John Bonet would be executed. The letter was signed SBTC Victory. So at this point, according to Patsy Ramsey, she then runs upstairs to John Bonet's room only to find her bed and her room empty. And then she goes and wakes John Ramsey up, freaking out, explaining to him what happened, what she found. And at this point, they go downstairs and they call the police, which the letter was really clear about not to call the police. So I don't know. To me, what do you guys think? Would you have called the police if you got a ransom letter like that saying not to or your daughter would be executed? What? How would you react? What would you do? So at 5.52 a.m., Patsy calls 911 and lets them know that her daughter has been taken. At this point, according to Patsy and John Ramsey, 
Burke Ramsey was still fast asleep in bed. Immediately after getting off the phone with 911, Patsy Ramsey calls a couple of her friends to see if they can come over and comfort her. I'm not sure why. She basically gets on the phone and immediately after the 911 call and asks her friends to come over. Two of the people she has to come over that morning were Fleet and Priscilla White, whose home they had been to the night before for a Christmas party. Around 6 a.m., the first police officer arrives at the Ramsey residence, and this is Officer French, and I guess Patsy was a little agitated because he was actually dressed in a police uniform, and he had a gun, and we're not really sure why, but she didn't like that. Maybe she expected a plainclothes detective, but either way, Officer French is the first officer on the scene. At this point, this is when the Ramseys claim that Burke woke up when the police came and walked into his room doing a cursory search of the house. And they shined a light in on him and he, you know, then kind of woke up and was like, what's going on? When the police start arriving, John and Patsy have Burke taken from their home and brought to the home of Flea and Priscilla White. At first, the police obviously think this is a kidnapping, so the FBI is notified and they are focusing most of their attention outside of the home instead of inside the home because they think a girl's been taken from the house. But around 1 p.m., Detective Linda Arndt, who is one of the first officers on the scene, she tells John Ramsey that they're going to do a search of the home. Even though they've kind of already walked around and done a cursory search, they are going to do together a search of the home from top to bottom. It is at this point that John Ramsey finds his daughter's lifeless body in the basement in their wine cellar. He picks her up, brings her upstairs, puts her down on the floor, and that is when everybody realizes this is no longer a kidnapping, this is a homicide case. The next day, her autopsy was completed. This is basically what the autopsy said. John Bonet had blonde hair worn in two ponytails. She had green eyes. She was wearing a small gold ring on one of her fingers, and on the palm of her left hand, a heart was drawn in red ink. She was wearing a long-sleeved white shirt with a sequined silver star on the front. On the sleeve was found dried mucus, most likely from her nose or mouth. She wore matching long-knit underwear and white underwear with roses and the word Wednesday embroidered on them. She had several injuries, including abrasions on the side of her face between her ear and jaw and petechial hemorrhages in her eyes. She had a very massive skull fracture along with bleeding and bruising on her brain. There was a white cord tying her wrist together and a white cord wrapped around her neck, double knotted around a wooden stick to make into a garrote, which is an apparatus used to strangle someone. I hope I said that word right, garrote, garrote. I remember once I pronounced a town in England wrong. I said it was Leicester instead of Leicester, and I literally was like run across the coals for it. Like nobody could ever forget it. Will they play this out loud for me? Garrote. I heard that? Okay, so a garrote. Now I have the word right. The garrote was basically fashioned from the broken handle of one of Patsy Ramsey's paintbrushes, which was also found in the basement. You use it to choke somebody with. So one end has like wood on it and the other end has wood on it and then there's a cord between. And the idea is that having the wooden pieces on each end make it easier to pull and choke somebody with. Her bladder was empty and there was some urine and blood also found in her underwear. She had some undigested pineapple still in her stomach. Basically, the autopsy stated that she had died from suffocation due to being strangled with that cord, but she also suffered before the strangulation a severe blow to the head, which would have basically caused her to become unconscious. According to the medical examiner, there was DNA found in the underwear of John Bonet mixed in with her blood, and the medical examiner decided that she had been sexually abused that night and also stated that it looked like there had been some long-term sexual abuse going on. John and Patsy were spoken to briefly by the police that day. Obviously, it was kind of crazy. People were coming and going, traipsing all over the crime scene, people that shouldn't have been there, such as their friends. And um, obviously, once John Bonet was found, Patsy and John were a mess. And so they weren't really questioned too heavily. Burke was questioned shortly by the police, 
but was never really questioned again. He was talked to by a counselor or like a social services person, but police never did interview Burke after that first couple of days. Within the weeks following their daughter's murder, after kind of feeling that they were under suspicion of the Boulder Police Department, John and Patsy Ramsey lawyered up. They were not questioned about the death of their daughter, until almost five months later. Okay, so now let's unpack this and peel back the layers a little bit and get deeper in, which is what we do, right? This is what we do here. We, we talk about the case, but we talk about the details of the case and we get deep. So the first piece of evidence that everybody finds honestly to be the most suspicious is that ransom note. So I'm going to read it to you really quickly. Now this ransom note is obviously handwritten and it's the longest ransom note in the history of the world. So it starts and it addresses John as Mr. Ramsey. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier delivery, which is crossed out, pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as the police, the FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good Southern common sense of yours. It's up to you now, John. Victory, S-B-T-C. Sounds like something from a movie, right? And in fact, many of these sentences and lines and the way that this kidnapper talks is taken directly from movies such as Dirty Harry and Speed. The paper the ransom note was written on was found to be from a writing pad in Patsy's desk. The pen was found also in the Ramsey home underneath the telephone. And there was two practice notes found. So the kidnapper had allegedly come into the house, either killed John Bonet before or after writing this letter, but then sat down to write a three page ransom note for a child that was probably already dead, used paper from Patsy's writing desk, used their pen that was already there, and you know, spent quite a bit of time writing this super dramatic ransom letter. Like I said, two practice notes were found, so this person really wanted to get this letter right. But isn't it strange that the kidnapper took so much time to write such an intricate letter where most of it, 75% of it, is repetitive and extraneous? Isn't it odd that a kidnapper would stay at the scene of a crime to write a long ransom letter when a couple sentences or even a paragraph would have sufficed? And they could have written this previously and brought it with them to the house so that all they had to do was drop it after doing the deed. Isn't that odd? And why would the kidnappers only ask for $118,000? This amount was eerily similar to the amount that John Ramsey had just received as a Christmas bonus from work. And nobody really but the Ramseys and the people at his company, Access Graphic, would know about that amount. Additionally, if they knew John Ramsey as well as they claimed to, they would know he was a multi-millionaire. They could have asked for a million dollars. Why ask for $118,000, which is such an odd number, when you could ask for a million dollars? Because you have somebody's daughter, you have leverage, you have the 
ability to ask for as much as you want to ask for from a man who has the money to give. A docu-series that CBS aired in 2016 called The Case of John Bonet Ramsey brought together a group of like forensic specialists and former police officers and pathologists to actually practice how long it would take to write this letter out. They discovered that writing the letter in its entirety would take 21 and a half minutes. And that's just actually copying it, not having to think about what you're gonna write and write it, which would have possibly taken longer. 21 and a half minutes of extra time in a home where you've either just murdered or plan on murdering a small child. 21 and a half minutes that you can possibly get caught in. Additionally, from the amount of time it would have taken to write the letter, this person would have had to searched through the house in order to find Patsy's writing pad in her desk and then they would have had to get a pen and then they would have had to sit down and write this letter and they practiced two times and failed before actually getting it right. Then they would have had to place the, the letter neatly on the spiral staircase. They would have had to have put the pad neatly back into Patsy Ramsey's desk, which they did. And all this time they are at a crime scene and they have the possibility of somebody waking up and catching them. It's pretty clear that the letter is going out of its way to make the reader believe that English is not the first language of the author. In the first paragraph, there's some grammar mistakes, there's misspellings, but after that first paragraph, the writer of the letter falls back into what I believe is their natural writing style, which is, you know, grammatically correct, using perfect punctuation, and no spelling errors at all. Forensic linguist profile Jim Fitzgerald put together a linguistic profile about what type of person the letter writer was, and here's the results. They decided that the writing ability of this person was high, and that the language one, which is the language they were born speaking, is English. The age of the person who wrote the letter was adult, so 30 or over, and the gender of the letter writer was suspected to be female. Handwriting expert Sina Wang spent three weeks in 2000 examining the note, comparing it to 100 samples of Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. She concluded that it was highly probable that Patsy Ramsey was the author of the note because she found uh, over 200 similarities between the note and Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. There was also many other people who did handwriting analysis and it's pretty split. A lot of people say that it was her handwriting and a lot of people say that it wasn't. It would appear, given the situation, given the information that we have, that the note wasn't a ransom note at all. John Bonet was either already dead or this person was planning and killing her. I suspect she was already dead. So they had nothing to leverage for money. Why would a person who knew that the child was still in the home and that the family would most likely discover the body pretty soon, ask for money when they had nothing to leverage for that money. Next, the 911 call. So I'm gonna play the original 911 call for you. So you go ahead and listen to that and then we'll talk about it. call, Patsy thinks she disconnects the call, but she doesn't. Before the phone does hang up, we hear a sort of conversation going on with what appears to be three different voices. Kim Archuleta, the 911 operator who spoke to Patsy that morning, recalls the same thing. She said she heard two, maybe three distinctly different voices that morning, and that's why she stayed on the line, because she said that things were being said that somebody needed to know. 
She had a bad feeling about the whole phone call. She said it felt rehearsed. Patsy's panicked tone that she had with her during the 911 call did not match the tone she then switched to when she thought she hung up the phone and she was talking to the people in the home with her. That change that happened when Patsy's voice went from panicked to pretty much calm and collected had always upset and unsettled Kim Archuleta. After John Bonet was found to be dead, Kim Archuleta was told she could not talk about the call to anybody, press, media, anybody, basically, who asked. She was under a gag order, essentially, so until they went to court and this was all settled, she couldn't talk to anybody. And yet, she was never asked to speak at the grand jury. She was never asked to give her statement. And even after, when the case was already settled, she was never asked about her opinion. Nobody approached her in the past 20 something, 22 years, and asked her, what did you think about Patsy Ramsey on the call that day? In 1997, the 911 call was examined by a company called Aerospace Corp. And basically, they tried to enhance it to see if they could figure out what was being said in the last moments of that call when Patsy thought she disconnected, but she didn't. The results were never officially released, which, why? Why would you try to figure out what was going on in the tape if you wouldn't, didn't want to release the results? But, but a year later, the National Enquirer actually did leak the results of the Aerospace Corps investigation on the 911 call. The CBS documentary that I spoke about earlier, um, they also brought in some experts to analyze and try to clean up the audio to make it more decipherable. And the results that both the Aerospace Corps and the um, CBS documentary, the results they found were eerily similar. I'm gonna play you the enhanced portion of the 911 call now, so see if you can hear what the people are saying. Patsy? Patsy? <laughs> okay, so the first voice is a man and it's assumed to be John Ramsey and if you hear the voice and you hear John Ramsey's voice I think they sound identical and he says in a stern manner to someone in the room we're not speaking to you the second voice a woman's assumed to be Patty's and it does sound like her is saying oh Jesus what did you do and a third voice a child's voice asks what did you find? Now I say that the first two voices are assumed to be Patsy's and John's, not only because it sounds like them, but because they were the only two adults in the house that day. And there were only two children in the home that day, and one of them was dead. So that third voice, described to be a child's voice, sounds like a child's voice to me asking, what did you find? It would have had to have been Burke Ramsey, right? But why would his parents say he was sleeping throughout the entirety of that early morning during the 911 call and he didn't wake up until the police came and shined a light into his room. Why is John Ramsey saying sternly to somebody, we're not speaking to you, and why is Patsy saying, what did you do? When I first heard that enhanced 911 call, I felt a lot of emotions, um, and I don't, I don't know why. You know, I got goosebumps, I teared up a little bit. I felt really sad for John Bonet at that point because I could just imagine, not that this is what happened, I'm not in any way saying that this is what happened, but I could imagine in the way that the 911 call was laid out for us, John, Patsy, and Burke just standing in the kitchen by the telephone, and John Bonet laying dead in the basement, all alone, cold, her entire family basically just at this point turning their backs on her. So the cleaned up version of the audio at the end of that 911 call really just um, hit me emotionally for some reason. The 911 call doesn't necessarily suggest that anybody in that house is guilty, but it does suggest that there's more to the story than we know, and there's more that the Ramseys knew that I believe we didn't know. Because why would they say Burke was asleep during the 911 call when he clearly was awake? We hear his voice on the 911 tape. The investigation into what happened to John Bonet seemed doomed from the start. There were a massive amount of people involved, and everybody wanted to be number one in this investigation. There's no one group of people that you can point the finger at and say, it's your fault that this investigation failed. It's your fault that evidence was tampered with and a crime scene wasn't roped off properly. It's your fault that we don't know who killed this girl today. But like I said, so many people and agencies were involved in this. So many people are to blame for what happened that morning that if they had worked together right from the get-go, I think this case could have been solved. It's a cut and dry case basically of 
these people forgetting what really mattered, which was finding justice for John Bonet, which was finding the murder of a little girl, no matter what path it led them down, no matter who it pissed off, no matter what came of it. It was about finding her murderer. The Boulder Police Department, the Boulder District Attorney, and the Ramseys and their attorneys formed a barrier to this investigation running really smoothly. It's a twisted mass of egos, of people trying to protect themselves, people trying to protect their political interests, people trying to protect their financial interests, people just kind of going down a path of personal vendettas. It's a mess. The police arrived shortly after 6 a.m., shortly after the 911 call, and then right after that, the friends that Patsy Ramsey called, they come over as well. At this point, they're treating this case as a kidnapping. Remember, they have not found John Bonnet's body yet, and John Ramsey says the FBI were supposed to be called and they never were called, and that's not true at all. Ron Walker, who's currently a retired federal agent, got the call around 9.30 and immediately sent agents to the police station to set up a command post. He also instructed agents to tap the Ramsey's phone in case they would be getting a ransom call so that way they could track where the call was coming from and find John Bonnet. Like I said, at this point, they still think they're dealing with a kidnapping. So obviously, they're not sending FBI agents to the Ramsey household at this time because John Bonet is not in the Ramsey household. She's been taken out of the Ramsey household, or this is the information they're operating on. Initially, Boulder police officers did a cursory check of the home, like we already talked about. What I didn't tell you was they went down into the basement, and the door to the wine cellar was locked or jammed. Or The police tried to open it, and they couldn't, and they kind of were just like, huh. Eh okay, we can't open it. And they didn't know, obviously, that John Bonet's body was right on the other side of that door. And had they found their body earlier on, this investigation would have gone a whole lot differently. But they decided, I guess, not to be thorough because they assumed the Ramseys were victims and not suspects. And the Boulder Police Department has since said that they were basically told to not treat the Ramseys as suspects by the DA's office, to basically handle them with kid gloves and go easy on them. And if they, you know, they couldn't answer questions, don't force them to. It was obviously politically fueled on the DA's part, in my opinion, because John and Patsy were wealthy. They were influential in society. They had a lot of clout and a lot of people think the DA went easy on them. In the meantime, Ron Walker receives a copy of this ransom letter and it's when he sees this ransom letter and reads it that he first begins to suspect the family. He says he immediately knew this letter was a red herring, that this was a staged kidnapping, that somebody basically wrote this letter in order to sell this whole concept of a foreign faction and you know outside sources trying to come in and take John Bonet. Ron Walker says as soon as he read the letter, he knew that the motive was not kidnapping and he suspected that they would eventually find John Bonet dead. At this point, he calls the officer on scene and he talks to Linda Arndt and he tells her to keep a, an eye on the family essentially, make sure they don't go anywhere, make sure that you know where they are at all times. Linda Arndt calls him back around noon and says that John Ramsey basically disappeared for about 90 minutes and when he came back, he was very agitated in a completely different kind of mindset and didn't really want to be talked to at all. We don't know where he went. He claims he went to his study. Nobody's ever proven or disproven that. Patsy was in the living room being consoled by a friend, so the police weren't really worried about her running off anywhere because there was a million people around her. Patsy loved to be the center of attention. And then there's, like I said, all these people tramping around a crime scene. So basically when Linda tells Ron Walker that John Ramsey had disappeared for a while, Ron tells her, okay, grab John, let's keep him busy. Tell him you're gonna do a search of the house from top to bottom and you want him to come with you just to see if you missed anything. This was mainly meant, like I said, as busy work for John Ramsey so he wouldn't disappear again. But as soon as Linda says to John, we're gonna search the house from top to bottom, we're gonna start at the top, the top floor, and work our way down, John Ramsey grabs his friend Fleet White and heads straight to the basement. Within moments of being down there, Fleet White reports that John opened the door to the wine cellar, yelled out, I found her, turned on the light, and then grabbed his daughter off the floor of the wine cellar, brought her upstairs, put her down on the floor upstairs, removed duct tape from her mouth, and tried to untie her wrists. I said John opened the door to the wine cellar, yelled out he had found John Bonet, and then turned on the light. So this is a wine cellar. It's very, very dark in a wine cellar. There's no windows. It protects the wine from sunlight. Aside from a small amount of light that would have been pouring in from the hallway in the, in the basement, which Fleet White says there wasn't much, 
that room would have been very, very dark and John Bonet was covered by a white blanket. So how would John Ramsey have known upon opening the door before turning the light on that he had found her body before turning the light on? That's a question that's always plagued me and others. It's also been speculated why he would go and remove the duct tape from her mouth and try to untie her wrists. And I'm not completely suspicious about that. It's his daughter. He probably didn't want to see her like that. He probably just wanted to help her. But either way, it is also strange that when he brought her up from the basement, he placed her directly on the floor and not on the couch, which was nearby, not on a table, not in a chair, on the floor. A lot of people think it was disrespectful of him and a lot of people think he did it in order to kind of place her in a high traffic area where a lot of different DNA and evidence would become attached to her body. Maybe almost to confuse a forensics lab when, when getting DNA testing. In the basement, it was also discovered that there was a broken window, which John himself had broken when he had forgotten his keys one day months before in a blue suitcase under that window that the family claimed had not been there before. However, there was no footprints in the snow outside that basement window, um, even though there wasn't much snow, but there was enough snow where you would have seen footprints, I think. And another thing that came to light was if it was an outside assailant, they wouldn't have really had to have broken in because several of the doors and windows that night were left unlocked and wide open and the alarm was never armed. I live in a very safe neighborhood. I mean, I think there's five cops that live on my street and the one over, but I would never ever, ever go to sleep without locking every single door in my house and checking those doors twice or three times. Maybe I might not all, like arm the alarm. I, I always do, but maybe I wouldn't. It would be more likely that I wouldn't than to leave my house wide open and unlocked while myself and my family slept there. Another detail that I found interesting, and so did the cops on scene that day, was that John, within hours after finding his daughter dead, got on the phone with the airport and asked them to get his plane ready. When he was asked about that later, he said, yeah, he did, he admitted it. He said that he wanted to go to Atlanta, Georgia and just be home where they were from and where John Bonnet was born. And that's why he called to get the plane ready. And I do kind of understand maybe not wanting to be in that house anymore, but at the same time, don't you think that the police are gonna wanna talk to you? Don't you think that you have a responsibility to do interviews with the police so that they can find out what happened to your daughter. And the Ramses were the only ones who were there that day. They were pretty much the only witnesses who were in the home when John Bonet was allegedly murdered. So wouldn't the police wanna to talk to them or else what leads would they have to go on? The officers on scene did think that this behavior was also strange. And one of them let Ron Walker know it as soon as he got there. And he arrived there around 2 p.m. So at this point, like I said, it was a kidnapping, which would have been under FBI jurisdiction. But at this point, it had turned into a homicide. And the jurisdiction fell back to the Boulder Police Department. The FBI offered to help. Ron Walker says that he told them, you know, we want to help. What can we do for you? We can get like 50 agents here right away. And the Boulder Police Department declined this offer. The Boulder police chief at this time was Tom Kobe, and I guess we'll never understand why he decided to decline the offer from the FBI, which, you know, Boulder was a pretty safe area. I think there was only something like 16 homicides in the past 10 years there. So the Boulder Police Department wasn't super adept at handling homicide cases, and the FBI is kind of specialized in this. They have manpower, they have skill, and why the Boulder Police Department wouldn't have wanted to utilize this help and these resources. I don't know, I think it has something to do with pride and I think it has something to do with like squatting rights and kind of like marking your territory, but that's just my opinion. The Boulder police did end up calling the FBI in the next day when I think they figured out they were in over their heads. But at this point, the most crucial part, which is the first 24 hours had already passed. Neighbors hadn't been interviewed. The family hadn't been interviewed besides a few questions asked at the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime hadn't been roped off. People had been in and out of it. What really should have happened is John and Patsy Ramsey being the parents of a homicide victim would obviously and should have been treated with respect and kindness, but they should have been separated. They should have been brought in to the station, put in different rooms with different people and interviewed separately to see if their stories matched up or if there were inconsistencies. It's more common for a child murdered in their own home to have been murdered by somebody living in that home. That should have happened. Their clothes that they were wearing that day and the day before should have been taken, collected, and tested. None of this ever happened. The Boulder Police Department handled this pretty poorly and it could have a lot to do with them thinking it was a kidnapping for so long and then knowing it was a murder, but I even feel like I know 
that a kidnapping could potentially turn into a murder. So you should probably treat it as that right from the beginning. Rope the place off, separate the witnesses, talk to them, get their statements, talk to neighbors, canvas the area. Like this is pretty basic stuff that you would know from watching Law & Order or Court TV. It's not called Court TV anymore, I don't think. It's what I remember when it was Court TV. Burke Ramsey was interviewed once by the police. What about Christmas Eve when you were going up there? Did you guys have a snack before you went to bed that night? I forget. Mm -hmm. oh. That's all I know. Pineapple. Pineapple. Yeah. You mentioned that once before. Is that kind of a favorite? Yeah. Really, really, really favorite thing. The CBS documentary, The Case of John Bonet, it does say that they thought he was acting strange and suspicious, but you have to remember this kid's nine. I do think there was times when he was like, oh, acting a little weird, especially when I think he said something like, I'm just gonna move on at this point. You know, it sounded almost like adult, like he'd heard somebody else say it or had been coached on what to say, but for the most part, he just acted awkward. I have a seven-year-old son, so I know when I'm talking to him about something that makes him uncomfortable, such as death, he kind of gets that way, kind of antsy and kind of silly and can't sit still and won't make eye contact because it's an awkward kind of situation and an awkward topic to talk about with a kid. It makes them uncomfortable. They haven't developed that mortality salience yet to realize that like one day everybody dies and they haven't come to grips with it because it's a hard concept even for adults to understand and wrap their head around. When kids talk about it, they get awkward, they get uncomfortable, it, it freaks them out and they act weird. So I did not think Burke Ramsey was acting super weird in the interview when he was young. Now, he did have an interview with Dr. Phil if you haven't seen it. I'll see if I can play a couple clips here, but I thought he was acting super weird in that interview, super weird. Like he smiled the entire time, the entire time. He had this weird, creepy smile on his face and every single person who saw that interview was thoroughly creeped out by him. There still are people that believe that you killed your sister. What, what do you say about that? Look at the evidence or the lack thereof. Dr. Phil explains that Burke is like a socially awkward person. From the time he was young, the media were always trying to get pictures of him and talk to him and you know, just were all around his house all the time. So his parents pretty much brought him into a life of seclusion and privacy in order to protect him from that. And because of that, he didn't really interact too much. From what I hear, he was kind of always an awkward, introverted child, but he just became more so when his parents sh tried to shield him from like the media and what was happening with his sister's case. And even now as an adult, he works remotely from home as like a computer analyst or something. So he, he still doesn't deal with people on a regular basis. So Dr. Phil says that this was more of an awkward facial expression like he did when he was a kid almost. Like he never evolved from that kind of reaction to awkward, uncomfortable topics. So he says this was an awkward facial expression from being uncomfortable and having to talk about things that he didn't want to talk about. I don't know him personally. I don't know him off of the camera. I don't know how he acts when you're one-on-one -on -one with him, but Dr. Phil said he did spend a lot of time with Burke Ramsey and he wasn't like that one-on-one -on -one, and he's a very normal, personable, intelligent man. So John and Patsy did not allow themselves to be officially questioned until May of 1997, almost five months after their daughter's death. And when they did allow themselves to be questioned officially, they had lawyered up and they had a lot of um, conditions to being interviewed. They said they had already cooperated with the police, which they really hadn't. Giving hair and DNA samples and things like that, which they did give voluntarily, but that's something you're kind of, it's compulsory, like you have to by law. They had the legal right to take those things, but to interview them, I guess they didn't have the legal right to do that. So John and Patsy thought they would lay out conditions like how long the interview would last and things like that. But one of these conditions that really upset and outraged the public was that John and Patsy insisted on having the transcripts from their original interview with the police on December 26th. And district attorney Alex Hunter agreed and gave them this transcript. So basically he gave them police evidence before they were formally questioned. It seemed obvious to people that the reason they wanted these transcripts was so they could get their story straight before being questioned again, so that they wouldn't say something different from the day that they were interviewed on the 26th to the day that they were interviewed in May of 1997. So essentially what it looks like to me is the Boulder Police Department thought that John and Patsy 
or Burke were responsible for John Bunny's death. The DA either did not think they were responsible or because of political reasons was protecting them and going easy on them. The Boulder Police Department was frustrated because they claimed the DA's office was basically telling them like, go easy on these people, don't question them, don't treat them as suspects. And that the DA's office was frustrated because the Boulder police were going so hard at John and Patsy that John and Patsy withdrew and lawyered up, which made it really tough to get any information from them. In late 1998, under public and police scrutiny and pressure, Alex Hunter decided that he would call a grand jury to decide if John and Patsy Ramsey were in fact responsible for their daughter's death. He presented the case to a grand jury of eight women and four men, over the course of the next year, this grand jury was presented with multiple pieces of evidence, heard testimony from dozens of witnesses, and even took a trip to the Ramsey home to see the crime scene themselves. Finally, Alex Hunter publicly stated that they would not be pursuing charges against the Ramseys. No charges have been filed. I and my prosecution task force believe we do not have sufficient evidence to warrant the filing of charges. What he didn't say, according to our partners at the Daily Camera, it was him, not the grand jury, who made that call. In Colorado, any decision made by the grand jury is considered private and can't be divulged by any grand jury member. They can be, you know, like arrested or fined if they do release any information. So it wasn't until some time later when it was discovered that the grand jury had indeed decided to indict John and Patsy Ramsey, but Alex Hunter made the decision on his own that he would not do that. He said he didn't believe that there was enough evidence to build a case against them, so he decided not to pursue charges against the Ramseys. So basically, it does not say in this indictment that John and Patsy were guilty of killing their daughter. It's saying that they're guilty of neglect, putting her in a position where she could be harmed by somebody else, and count seven even goes as far as to say as they knew who did it and they were helping cover it up. So the theories are obviously pretty basic. Either somebody in the home did this or somebody outside of the home did this. Let's quickly talk about the suspects. The DNA found on John Bonet was discovered to be from an unknown male. And although many forensic scientists and investigators have used the idea of touch DNA for the reason the DNA may be there, the Ramseys were officially cleared by the DA at that time, Mary Lacey in 2008. Touch DNA is based on the theory that the DNA found in Jan Bonet's underwear could have been placed there by somebody not even in the country, basically. The underwear she was wearing could have shown traces of DNA of the man in like a Chinese factory who packaged the underwear. And because of touch DNA, which just means DNA transfers upon touching another piece of clothing, the DNA could have transferred from her underwear to the waistband of her pants or vice versa. But a small amount of the DNA found in Jan Bonet's underwear was also found under her fingernails. So they did kind of go on the lines that this DNA was the DNA of the man who had killed Jan Bonet, and that's who they started looking for, and they started eliminating suspects based on the DNA. However, nobody in the Ramsey household, none of them matched the DNA profile. None of them could be considered guilty based on DNA alone. Michael Halgoth, a Boulder resident whose family owned a local salvage yard, two days after Alex Hunter basically went public and made a statement that they had DNA and they were narrowing down the list of suspects and soon only the only person left on the list was gonna be you and he points at the camera. Two days after Alex Hunter makes that statement, this man, Michael, is found dead in his apartment. Uh, apparently it was suicide. A coworker of his gave police information that made him believe Michael could have been involved in John Bonet's death, but he didn't match the DNA profile. Gary Oliva is another man that they thought could have been involved. He was actually a convicted pedophile who used to hang around the Ramsey neighborhood, and he admitted to having an obsession with John Bonet. He told 48 Hours in 2002 that John Bonet had come to him after she died and revealed herself to him, whatever that means. At the time of her murder, he was living right down the street from the Ramsey residence. And he attended a candlelight vigil that was held in her memory. He was arrested four years after John Bonet's death. It was found in his book bag that he had a picture of her cut from a magazine as well as a stun gun. And the stun gun was significant because there was marks found on John Bonet's lower back 
that they had come to the conclusion it was from a stun gun that had been used to disable her so that the person could then take her down to the basement and kill her. And this man, Gary, has the stun gun in his backpack as well as a picture of her. A friend of Oliva claims that shortly after John Bonet's death, Gary Oliva called him and said, I've hurt a little girl, I've hurt a little girl. So basically confessed to doing something to a young girl. And this same friend thought that the Nats used to tie the garret also implicated Gary Oliva because those same knots were used in a telephone cord that Gary had used to try to strangle his own mother. He's always claimed that he didn't hurt or kill her and DNA has basically eliminated him as being a suspect. John Mark Kerr. So he was a school teacher at the time of John Bonet's death and he's also a raging pedophile. He actually confessed to the murder in 2006 while living in Thailand on the run from American authorities because he was caught with child pornography. He basically confessed this to a University of Colorado professor who was doing a documentary on John Bonet and then obviously that professor called the police and they went to go get Kerr in Thailand and brought him back. It was discovered later that Kerr wasn't even in Boulder or anywhere near Boulder at the time of her death and obviously DNA eliminated him as well so he obviously was just like a creep looking for some kind of attention or just wanting to get close to this case in John Bonet in some way. He had these super disturbing diary entries that he claimed were written at the scene of the crime describing what he was doing to her is awful. So this guy's a sicko and if that doesn't scare you enough, he was released and he now lives in the Pacific Northwest under a new identity and a new gender too. So keep a lookout guys, steer clear. Like, I'm gonna go off topic for really quick, but I don't understand why when, when people are clearly dangerous to children, why they are ever allowed out to wander the streets again. And I know like, okay, we can't lock this guy up forever for possessing child pornography, but I know that these people are not kept an eye on as well as the police want you to think. I mean, they found that like within a couple miles of the Ramsey residence, there was something like 38 pedophiles living like on the, the sex offender registry. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little off topic, but there just has to be a better way. There has to be a better way to handle pedophiles and sex offenders who attack and hurt young innocent children. Like there has to be a better way, right? Am I right? Bill McReynolds was the local Santa Claus and he had entertained children at the Ramsey's annual Christmas party that year, 96, and the year before in 1995. It was whispered afterwards that he maybe paid a little bit too much attention to John Bonet at the party that night and that he had taken her aside and made a special promise that Santa was gonna pay her a special visit after Christmas. John Bonet had given Bill McReynolds a vial of gold glitter that year at the Christmas party, and she gave him one the year before as well. I don't think Bill McReynolds is guilty at all, but I think he, like many others, were taken in by John Bonet and just kind of, they kind of fell in love with her. Like she was a, an easy child to fall in love with. She was gorgeous. She had a beautiful smile. She was charismatic. She was kind and sweet and you know, giving and people really felt you know, endeared to her. So I think he just kind of fell into the John Bonet world where she charmed him and he, he felt close to her. Bill McReynolds was quoted as saying, the stardust was all I took with me for good luck when I had heart surgery last summer. Her murder was harder on me than my operation. She made a profound change in me. I felt very close to that little girl. I don't really have other children that I have this special relationship with, not even my own children or my own grandchildren. When I die, I'm going to be cremated. I've asked my wife to mix the stardust John Bonet gave me with my ashes. We're going to go up behind the cabin here and have it blow away in the wind. Is that a little strange? Yeah. Does it mean he's like a child rapist and murderer? No, I think he's a lonely guy. He probably didn't have a great relationship with his kids. I don't know. It's weird that he wanted the gold glitter that she gave him mixed in with his ashes. It's weird, but I don't think he did it. I don't think he's a killer. DNA also eliminated him as a suspect. Patsy passed away from ovarian cancer in 2006, two years before being officially exonerated from her daughter's death. But here's why a lot of people believe that John Bonet's mother is responsible for her death. 
She basically treated her daughter like a living doll. She dressed her up. She put makeup on her even when she wasn't in a pageant. She even bleached her hair to make it appear more blonde, which to me is crazy. Like this child, when her hair was bleached, was under six years old and it's that's crazy you should not bleach a little girl's hair it's gonna destroy it and not only that but they're they're like a baby let them have their normal hair color hated that apparently in the weeks leading up to her death john Bonet was having problems with bedwetting and according to people who knew the family it drove patsy nuts some theorize that the night of the murder, John Bonet wet the bed again, which would be confirmed or supported, at least, by the evidence that there was urine found in her underwear, and Patsy basically flew into a rage. She was stressed out, it was Christmas time, there was a lot going on, they had to leave for vacation the next morning, she was probably tired, and she just threw into a rage and slammed her daughter's head into something hard, like a bathtub or the side of a table. This would explain the blow to her head, which was the ultimate reason for John Bonet's death, because experts did analyze the autopsy and everything, and they kind of realized that the blow to the head was actually what killed John Bonet, not the strangulation. Then realizing what she had done, Patsy panicked, made this whole murder scene and ransom note to cover up what she had done, and then called the police and reported her daughter as having been kidnapped. In this theory, I'm not sure if John and Burke are aware of what happened or if they're just kind of like going along with it or if she didn't even tell them, but that is what some people believe. So the CBS docuseries, The Case of John Bonet, strongly suggested that Burke Ramsey was the culprit of his sister's death. Like strongly suggested. They never came right out and said it, but they suggested it and he is actually suing them at this time for that suggestion, which he says is preposterous. The theory that they put forth in the docu-series lays out a story of an accidental death and two parents who didn't want to lose both their children. John Bonet had undigested pineapple in her stomach. On the table of the family's home that same day was found a bowl of pineapple. It has been suggested that Burke was eating pineapple that night or early the morning of the 26th, and John Bonet, because pineapple was her favorite snack, kind of ran by and grabbed a piece out with her finger, just taking it, maybe not even asking him, and maybe just like running away laughing, kind of like little sisters do to brothers or older siblings. Like they harass them, they like torture them. It's, it's what they do. But according to the CBS docuseries, Burke could have then gone into a rage, grabbed a flashlight, which was sitting on the counter of the Ramsey home as well, and hit John Bonet over the head with the flashlight, causing the skull fracture, which eventually caused her death. Once his parents realized what happened, they concocted this elaborate story to cover it up because John Bonet was dead and they didn't want Burke to be taken away. They did what they could to protect the child that was still left alive. As soon as the police started showing up at the Ramsey household, the Ramseys had Burke taken and brought to Fleet White's house, so maybe to remove him from the eyes of the police so they couldn't question him and talk to him. Burke was described as kind of an introvert, you know, kind of kept to himself, just played video games, didn't really interact too much, and he had accidentally, according to Patsy, hit John Bonet in the face with a golf club before. I believe it could have been an accident, the golf club thing. Believe me, my kids hurt each other all the time, and they're not purposely doing it. They just play rough, and it gets out of control. But a lot of people have used that previous incident with the golf club as supporting evidence that Burke could have taken the flashlight and smashed his sister over the head with it, being mad that she had grabbed his pineapple. The docu-series did say that his behavior in the interview was strange. It seemed like he was hiding something. I've already stated I don't believe that his childhood interview was strange, but I do believe the interview he did 20 years later with Dr. Phil was strange, but Dr. Phil has explained that behavior in his own way, so you make your own conclusions on that. Even if it is explained by him being socially awkward, you have to admit that watching that interview like leaves you feeling severely unsettled. There's also the question of his voice being heard on the 911 call where he says, what did you find? So why is John Ramsey saying to Burke, we're not speaking to you or we're not talking to you? Why is Patsy asking him, what did you do? And why is Burke asking them, well, what did you find? Especially when the Ramsey said that he was asleep the entire time. So it does appear that they maybe were hiding his presence there that morning, whether to protect him just from media scrutiny or to protect him from being, you know, associated with the crime of killing his sister 
we probably will never know. Additionally, the marks on John Bonet's back, which had previously thought to have been belonging to a stun gun or been put there by a stun gun, have also been affiliated with marks from the end of a railroad track. You know, like a toy train goes on a track and the pieces of the railroad track go together. So the ends are kind of pointed so they'll fit into the, the ends of the other tracks. And the marks on her back match those train tracks almost perfectly. I would say perfectly. I wouldn't even say almost perfectly. They match pretty much perfectly. And the marks also appear to have been put onto her back post-mortem, so after she had died. So that CBS documentary theorizes that maybe this is something a small child, like a nine-year-old would do. If they had accidentally hit their sister so hard, she had passed out or died. They would try to shake her, try to get a response out of her. Once they found her unresponsive, maybe they would take something like the train track, which was in the very next room from the wine cellar, and poke her on the back to see if, if they could get a response from her. In my opinion, I don't believe that John or Patsy Ramsey killed their daughter. If anything, they may have covered it up or known more about it, in my opinion. I think that John Bonet was an investment to them, and if you don't believe that they cared about John Bonet as a daughter or a person, understand that they most likely cared about protecting their investment. Patsy was living vicariously through John Bonet. They had put a ton of money and time and effort into her pageant career. She was successful, she was well known. It kept Patsy in the, in the spotlight where she wanted to be. So I don't think that either parent would go ahead and take out that kind of investment. If Burke was involved, I don't believe he killed her purposely. I think it was an accident. And if he was involved, his parents would have possibly covered it up in order to keep him from any harm coming to him as well. Do I think there was some sort of jealousy on Burke Ramsey's part? Absolutely. Burke was introverted. Burke wasn't, you know, outgoing. His sister was the outgoing one. His sister was the one everybody loved and wanted to be around. His sister was the one that everybody, you know, saw in pageants. She was charming and charismatic and drew people to her and people just loved her and wanted to be around her. And John Ramsey worked a lot. He wasn't around a lot. So Burke may not have had that that father figure around because he wasn't home that often. He was a very hard worker and he was out of town a lot. And Patsy Ramsey, well, she spent a lot of her time focused on John Bonet and her pageants and getting her ready for the pageants. And so Burke may have just been kind of feeling like pushed to the side by everybody. And yeah, he might have felt some kind of jealousy and there might have been some kind of sibling rivalry, which is completely normal. Maybe that night when she grabbed the pineapple, he was like, dude, can I have one thing to myself? And he snapped and lost it and hit her. This is speculation. Don't come for me. Don't sue me. This is just what I theorize might have happened or the motives or emotions or feelings behind why it might have happened. But I'm not saying it happened or that Burke Ramsey is guilty in any way. The problem is with this case, she was on such public display. She was in pageants. She was dressed very provocatively for a young girl. She had her hair and makeup done in the way that an adult woman would have her hair and makeup done, not like a six-year-old. She went to a dance studio where the dance floor was open to the public. Like people could just come in and watch the little girls dancing. In her general area of Boulder, she was well known, like kind of a mini celebrity. Like she was the little John Bonet. She was the pageant girl. She was the beautiful little girl who sang and danced on stage. And because she was opened up to such public awareness, it opened her up to where her murder could have been done by anybody. The 911 call, the ransom note. John Ramsey finding her without turning the light on and kind of knowing exactly where to go when they suggested that he search the house, he went to the basement first. These are all things that look suspicious, but they don't necessarily suggest guilt. The Ramseys have been cleared by the Boulder District Attorney in 2008. All the other suspects have been cleared by DNA. This is a actual mystery. We don't even have any suspects. And of course, they're still working on this case. There's a lot of people who are still looking into this case and it's not a cold case by any means because it's still being investigated. And I really hope that something comes out about this case. I feel absolutely terrible about what happened to John Bonet. I mean, she was beaten and I mean, she wasn't treated very nicely before her death. She was six years old. She literally had so much personality. And like I said before, and I can't say it enough, everybody loved her. And I keep saying that because it's really indicative of 
a child's personality when everybody feels like they love her and they want to be around her and they enjoy being around her. A lot of adults hate being around kids sometimes, but most adults just really loved being around John Bonet. She was personable, she was open, she was friendly. It's pretty telling of what kind of character she had as a child. Do I think that she had the easiest life? No. Do I think that there weren't any issues behind the scenes between John and Patsy and her and Burke? No. Every every family has issues, every family has things underneath the surface that they don't want necessarily shown, but I think for the most part, she seemed to be a really happy girl. She seemed to really love life. And it's so, so sad that it had to be ended and taken from her so soon and in such a horrible way. But we can rest easy that there are so many people out there who still think about John Bonet, who still try to figure out what happened to her, who still make content like this, this video. They make videos, they make stories, they write books, they, you know, ask questions questions. There's people out there who will always try to find out what happened to her and, you know, probably won't rest until they do. So now the thing with this DNA that really bothers me is like nobody's matched to it. Could it be? I'm not sure how DNA works, but could it be the DNA was like corrupted when being collected? Could it be that DNA samples even got mixed up in the lab and this DNA that we're looking at and comparing to everybody wasn't even the DNA found on John Bonet's body, I just feel like that DNA has excluded everybody. So if you're excluding people based on the DNA profile alone, you have no suspects. Even though so many other suspicious events happened between the family and the suspects outside of the family, based on DNA alone, all these people have been cleared. And I don't necessarily know if that was the right way to go. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Please let me know in the comments what you think about the theories, who you think could have done this, and we want to make sure that she's never ever forgotten. Even if we don't ever figure out who did this to her or what exactly happened to her, we want to make sure she's not forgotten. Thank you guys for being here. I hope this wasn't too long, and if it is, I'll break it up into two parts so it's a little bit easier to digest. Thank you so much again for being here with me. I really appreciate you guys. I've loved interacting with you via comments and on Instagram and stuff. And go ahead and follow me on Instagram so you can keep up with what's been going on in my life and on my channel. I appreciate each and every one of you. I can't believe the amount of support and love I've gotten from you guys. And that's why I put so much effort and research and time into these videos because I know you really enjoy them. And these are the types of videos I would wanna see with as much detail as possible. I know you guys like it, so I'm going to keep giving them to you as long as I can. Now, these Mystery Mondays do typically take an entire week to research. So if I'm ever like MIA during the week or even the weekend and not answering to comments right away, I will get to your comments on Instagram and YouTube, but I'm probably like face deep into my computer and just, you know, kind of engrossed into a case trying to get it all done and researched before I have to record the video. So do try to get to the comments and I try to respond to every comment and I definitely read every single one of your comments. So I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Have a fantastic day and I will see you next time. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Was gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you But now you should have somehow realized what you gotta do and I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now Backbeat the word is on the street that the fire in your heart is out and I'm sure you heard it all before But you never really had a doubt But I don't believe that anybody Feels the way I do about you now mm -hmm. And all the roads we have to walk are winding And all the lights that lead us there are blinding Would like to say to you, but I don't know how. But 
Cause me, babe You gotta be the one that saves me